This time on the Highland Woodworker. Fine Woodworking Magazine at 40 will take you to the Taunton Press and show you firsthand how each issue unfolds. It's nice when it has that little bit of air cushion ride down like that. Fine Woodworking Magazine's Matt Kinney shows us some out of the box techniques crafting wooden boxes of any size. And for decades, Lee Nielsen Tool Works has been putting heirloom quality hand tools in the hands of fine woodworkers around the globe. Some of the most interesting tools to me had a, had a beauty as well as a function. Spend a moment with master toolmaker Thomas Lee Nielsen. These stories and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where I get my fine tools for woodworking and a great woodworking education. It's in. Chuck, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Ed, this is a big day. I want a state-of-the-art, great handheld router. Have you got something that might satisfy that need? I think so. We'll go on back to the Festool section and show you their range of routers. It's pretty amazing. I can't wait. But first, we're going to take you to Connecticut to find Woodworking Magazine's office and see what happens behind the scenes. Very cool. Hello, Tom. Chuck, nice to meet you. This is exciting. Uh, a woodworker at Fine Woodworking Magazine's headquarters, the Taunton Press, and you're the editor. It's like Mecca. Oh, almost. yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> well, listen, uh, I see some things here that just really stir me up as a woodworker. We've got uh, the bowl. Yes. Number one, issue number one. That was the the first cover we, we made, and um, this is the iconic piece that made that cover. Between the initial number one and the fine woodworking 40th 40. anniversary, uh, there's so many woodworkers who have grown yes. their skills and their enjoyment of woodworking between these two issues. When I started to talk about the 40th anniversary, we had a bunch of readers write into me and say, hey, I'm a charter subscriber. And so I ran a few of their letters, and then I got a flood of other letters saying, hey, I've been with you guys since issue number one, too, so I have a collection of 20 to 25 readers who said, I'm part of the family. You know, I've been here since issue number one. And that's pretty compelling when you think about 40 years. That's, you know, 1975. I was only, I think, nine years old when, when this was started. And so here I am as the franchise leader, and, you know, boy, it's been around 40 years. You have these wonderful artifacts, not only the bowl, yeah. but a well, this, Rogowski sideboard. This piece was on uh, a cover in 1997. It's right there. And Gary Rogowski uh, did this amazing project on it. Um, and it's an iconic piece. And in, back in those days, we often bought the furniture that we commissioned the authors to make. And uh, that's why you see so many of the pieces in our offices. There's stuff everywhere, and it's all part of Paul's vision, you know, in 1975 when he decided that there wasn't any woodworking information out there for, to help people who want to do things with their hands. He said, heck, I can start a magazine. And so he and his wife and a team of other folks, you know, I think he signed up Tay Frid pretty early, decided let's do a magazine. And they sent out, I don't remember how many subscription cards they sent out initially, and I think in the first four days after they sent these things out, they got 800 yeses. And then with, within weeks, they were up to 3,000. And 800 was their wow. initial goal. And so it just blossomed and took off, and people said, yeah, I'm in. I want to I be part of this. It's all from a little house in Newtown. And here is my office, and you'll see right away the most comfortable office chairs you could ever imagine sitting in. Brian Bond. Yes. It's just amazing. When we start planning issues, we throw, well, I throw magnets on the board and I meet with my art director, Mike Pekovich. We try to pick a good mix of articles and topics and skill levels. And you know, I know we're in a digital age, but the magnets are very helpful. When we get a submission from a reader, we take the submission 
print it out and put it into a yellow folder. We call it a, a YJ, for short for Yellow Jacket. And then it circulates among the staff and we try to gain interest, you know, see if people are interested in the topic and they try to weigh in on whether they think it's a good idea, bad technique, um, solid, whatever. And then we judge whether we're going to do the article based on that. And so once an article is approved, it goes through different phases. There's an outline that gets generated by the author and essentially the manuscript gets edited. Once we are into the editing phase, <clears throat> the editor, the sponsoring editor we call them, um, will go out, generate <clears throat> a manuscript, and then we'll go actually go and do the photos. And eventually all that stuff gets put into our layout form. You know, you go from this where you see comments, questions, and you know, dimension fixes and things like that to something that is very clean. And so at this point, we verified all of the information is correct. We're happy how it reads. And um, our copy editor basically hits send. And a few weeks later, we get the cover image that Mike wanted. And then you get the article in full color. We've been around 40 years as a print publication, but we are also a very uh, digital-oriented company. And, you know, fine woodworking has really been at the fore um, in that realm, you know, generating video content, um, blogging, and, and just getting a lot of material um, from the same people, the same passionate audience, but it gives us a wider grasp. We're finding authors now through Instagram photos. So like we'll just be on there and see a photo of a piece of furniture, or what someone is doing and say, hey, that's great. And we'll find out that they're, you know, a, some, someone that's under 30. And so the craft is, it's still there. It's bubbling up. It's, it's everywhere. You gotta reach them uh, as y'all are doing in a yeah. different way. Yeah. And they'll grow too. And maybe we'll have 80, 100 years of <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much for this Thanks, great Chuck. tour. Thanks, Chuck. I'm glad you made it. Head on back to the area of the Fest Tool back here in the back of the store. Everything Fest Tool. You got four different routers. And it's a great range of routers from the largest to the smallest. And right in the middle is the OF 1400EQ. This router is a great uh, horsepower rating and a great size. Uh, easy to pick up, easy to manipulate like on a router jig, do freehand routing with. Um, Typical great dust collection that Festool offers on all their tools. How about bits and collet sizes? Um, from quarter inch to half inch, it also handles eight, uh, eight millimeter uh, shank sizes as well. And the ability to actually change the bits is super easy with a single wrench and a ratcheting mechanism that just allows you to ratchet to, to loosen and ratchet to tighten. It's a great feature. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait to get it into my shop. Coming up. Fine Woodworking Magazine's Matt Kinney, unhinged, showing us the finer points of boxing on any scale. Uh, I thought, well, it would be interesting to see if we could make this a business where you could produce um, in a efficient way and make, you know, regular deliveries, but make it to a very, very high standard. A moment with Thomas Lee Nielsen. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average, down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Order a Saw Stop Professional Cabinet Saw in March or April of 2016 and choose either one of these accessories for free. That's a $199 extra value. Put a Saw Stop in your shop.
What is quality? Is it quick? Forgettable? Easy? No, it isn't quick or easy. It isn't forgettable. Quality takes work. It takes time. Quality lasts. And it starts at Bell Forest, a leading global supplier of figured and exotic woods. Order online at bellforestproducts.com. Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect Forest Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Fine Woodworking Magazine's Matt Kinney has some out-of-the-box tips when it comes to creating boxes without hinges, this time on Finer Points. Matt, I just love your boxes. Oh, I mean, you. yeah, they're, they're beautiful in 52 boxes. In 52 weeks. Wow. I mean, <laughs> that's something. And the scale... Most of them are small. Yes. And if you're using to, if you're used to building big things, small things are a different challenge. And you've got all of these lids. Yeah. And you accomplish them in different ways. Can yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Tell so me about it. one of the things I realized when I was going to make 52 boxes is that I didn't want to have to buy 52 pairs of hinges. So I started to think about different ways to secure a top to a box without using hinges. And the simplest way to do that, which is this little box here, uh, is simply to have a rabbit cut on the inside edge of the box sides, and then the lid just sits down inside it. So uh, the lid stays on, it's secure, no hinge. And it it's, sits proud, it, it provides line and shadow. The things exactly, that, yeah. yeah. So you could uh, make that top a lot of different ways, but I do like to have it be proud of the sides to create a bit of a shadow line, a bit of step back, set back. And it becomes not just a way of avoiding hinges, but also uh, becomes part of the design. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so I like that method. And here's another uh, simple method. Uh, this box, the rabbit on the outside here is just decorative. How the lid stays on is that on the underside of the lid, there's a rabbit, and the field that remains fits down inside the box. So that keeps the lid on there. And again, this is another fairly easy technique because all you really need is a rabbiting bit, or you could do it with a dado set at the table saw. Um, and that keeps the lid on. It's nice and simple. Uh, a little more complicated but similar version of that is uh, a box like this where I glued up the sides with the top and bottom in and then I cut it apart and after I cut it apart I put a rabbit around the bottom or the, of the box and also a rabbit around the lid and then into that rabbit on the lid I glued this decorative banding and that just fits right over that rabbit there and holds the, lo the lid in place. And it doesn't take much. No. Yeah. No, that's, bare that's maybe a, a, a sixteenth of an inch there. 
uh, by about, uh, it's about a 16th inch square when it's closed like this. So, and the, and the little banding there is just a tiny bit proud of the surface to give your fingers something to, to grab onto and to hold. So. Well, that's, that's just beautiful. And, and of course, I love the, the scale. How about this box? Yeah, so this is actually, uh, could be the easiest way of all. It's simply a box over a box. Ah. But this one has no bottom, and this one has no top. And so you just drop it on there and it goes down. And the way to make this one is you start with the lid, and then you mill the parts for the bottom to fit inside the lid so that you get a nice tight fit like that. Yeah, beautiful fit. Mm -hmm. and you, you, it's nice when it has that little bit of air cushion ride down like that. Yeah. So. Supplied by gravity. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And then this lid is sort of an old standby, which uh, a lot of people know about. It's a uh, liner inside the box. And the liner comes up just past the box body and fits inside the lid. And uh, the way I've done this one is to make the box body uh, glue in the top and the bottom and then cut it apart. But here, <clears throat> when I cut it apart, I wanted to keep that distance the same so that the circles would be look complete rather than missing part if you put it back down. So this liner, there's also a liner inside the lid which creates that shadow line, that separation between the lid and the body so that the circles don't lose any of their uh, ra radius or fullness. They're, you know, so. Um, so that's five different ways to top a box. That's wonderful. I can't wait to get back to my shop and give it a try. Thanks. You know, the answer is an economics question. It's not a, 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 a tool making question. Still ahead, master toolmaker Thomas Lee Nielsen and how he handled venturing into uncharted territory. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs, easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rammer bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Woodpeckers, makers of fine woodworking tools like router tables, precision router lifts and fences, plus measuring and layout tools including squares, rules, triangles and more. We offer unique clamps like box clamps, the knuckle clamp and X-mat system. Our one-time tool program offers woodworkers innovative new tools. Woodpecker's precision tools are made and tested using state-of-the-art equipment. Woodworking tools from Woodpecker's. Tools you can trust for generations to come. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Moment with the Master is brought to you by Woodpeckers. We're in Warren, Maine, home of Lee Nelson Tool Works. We're going to go inside and talk to Thomas Lee Nielsen himself on our Moment with a Master. Yeah. 
These are the sights and sounds that you would see and hear on any given workday at Lee Nielsen Tool Works. This is where world famous fine woodworking tools are produced, assembled, and packaged to ship to very happy woodworkers. These beautiful heirloom tools are made with a blended mix of modern machinery and skilled human hand and eye work. Located right off Route 1 in Warren, Maine, their showroom is always open to the public. This large operation was certainly not built overnight. It all started 35 years ago with master hand tool maker Thomas Lee Nielsen and his vision for high quality tools that would become the epitome of form and function. Tom. It's so nice to be here in your shop or classroom. This is a beautiful space. Thank you very much, Chuck. Good to have you here. Well, I tell you what, uh, I'd like to know what the starting point was for young Tom, the uh, soon to be uh, boutique toolmaker uh, par excellence. Well, it goes back a long ways to growing up here in Midcoast, Maine and my father was a boat builder. He had a shop nearby where he employed uh, men, they were all men at that time, who could do extraordinary things with their hands. It was not necessarily inspiring at the time because I didn't know any better, it seemed normal to me, but they made everything. They built the boats uh, from scratch using mostly local materials. Uh, they made the hardware, they made the patterns to have hardware cast, they did some machining, and they've been building boats for decades, and they were um, just a wonderful uh, group of people to be around in the environment. You know, thick sawdust on the floor, big old machinery, and a big boat in the middle of the, of the shop being built was uh, just beautiful. As a teenager, Tom became friends with a boat designer his father worked for, who became an instrumental inspiration. His name is Francis Harishoff, and he was a designer of some wonderful, wonderful, uh, well, yachts, but racing yachts in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. He had built these beautiful machines that performed very, very well, but also were, were exquisitely beautiful. So he had a sense of, a very strong sense of design and uh, how that related to the function of, yeah. the, of, the, of the yacht. The last time I visited him, um, I was talking about uh, being a boat builder because I was about 16. I thought that would be what I would wind up doing. Um, and we talked a little bit about that for a while and he, rummaged around in a cupboard and found some old blueprints that he had that he obviously didn't need because he gave them to me and he said, uh, here, he said, study that. That's all you need to do. You don't need to go to school. You can learn from the boat. And so I um, did. Later on, I went to New York City and I found a job by chance at Garrett Wade. And uh, at the time they were <clears throat> selling a very large selection of high-end hand tools, the best they could find in the world. And um, most of those came from Europe or Japan, Germany, England, uh, not so much from the United States. And I became aware that that was strange. I didn't understand why that was. Uh, customers would be coming in and complaining about um, things they couldn't get uh, or about poor quality of what they were able to get compared to what, you know, the old tools their fathers or grandfathers had used or maybe passed on to them. And I didn't think that made sense either. It seemed to me that, uh, you know, had better tools, better machines, better materials available for manufacturing at that point why couldn't we do a better job? And the answer is not, you know, the answer is an economics question. It's not a, a, a tool making question. But I <clears throat> really um, was drawn to some tools that were made by um, certain individuals in their back, you know, backyard garage or basement 
their tools and the most interesting tools to me had a um, had a beauty as well as a function that I was drawn to, and uh, one in particular was <coughs> this bronze edge plane, which was made by a gentleman in Long Island named Ken Wisner, who was a brilliant machinist, but he also also had an aesthetic eye, and he finished things off beautifully. He did make a few of these out of iron, but most of them were bronze, highly polished, and beautiful to feel. It has a nice warmth in the hand, and uh, doesn't break. Doesn't break if it gets dropped. And having seen a number of tools come back from customers or from uh, the shipping companies that were broken, uh, I knew that was a problem. So bronze made a lot of sense to me, and this was a, a beautiful tool. Mr. Wisner decided that he didn't really like production work, sitting there polishing all day long and machining all day long. And in fact, he didn't deliver very regularly, um, <laughs> as most of the small makers didn't in those days. Um, so when we got these uh, shipment of these tools in, they'd be gone right away. And uh, I thought, well, it would be interesting to see if we could make this a business where you could produce um, in a efficient way and make, you know, regular deliveries, but make it to a very, very high standard. And he did. A few years later, Tom was making three tools, edge planes, block planes, and beading tools. I couldn't um, expand much beyond that without um, doing something different. And that's when I moved down here. And after Settling in, I got some full-size metalworking equipment because before I was working in a woodshed and I had a little small milling machine and a small lathe. Yeah. So this was really the leap of faith. This was. This yes. was the time when I devoted this, uh, you know, 100% to this. After devoting his time to his hand tool business, it expanded quickly. In order to help the turnaround time, Tom learned the art of making castings. I had a small foundry here for about six years until it got to be um, too big. We needed too many castings for my small foundry to really handle. But that was a very, very important part of the uh, learning process. Um, I learned what good castings are and how to make them and, and how to troubleshoot most of all. It was interesting to see uh, a, uh, I guess, right out of the casting uh, hand plane Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, yes. it has little tabs on yep. it and things that mm -hmm. all have to be machined, yep. and and uh, quite a process from there. Yes. And all all the rest of that is done here. Yes. yes. Yeah. We do all the processing after after the casting here, but um, we we use a lot of castings, and we work with two great foundries: one that casts bronze, one that casts iron, and the iron foundry is here in Maine, which I'm pleased to say. So it's yeah. nice to have them here. So the ductile iron. That was well, ductile iron is quite a special material. Um, it uh, goes by several names. That's one of them. Spheroidal graphite is another. Nodular is another. Uh, and basically, it's, tr it's cast iron that's treated in such a way that the molecular structure within the iron, instead of being sharp, is more rounded, which means under stress, it will not break, not shatter, in the way gray cast iron does quite easily. But I didn't know that right away. And um, I wanted to make this tool from the beginning. This is a great tool. It's a low angle jack plane. This is the original Stanley. And um, when we started, you know, if you notice these castings are really, you know, they're really beautiful castings. Um, oh, but yes. they're a little thin. And um, oftentimes, this tool, the low angle jack, but also the smaller block planes would crack behind the mouth. And um, it's because it's very thin there under the blade, but it's also because the material is brittle and the blade is quite thin. So if you take a heavy cut and you hit a knot, the blade's gonna flex, it's gonna bend down and uh, might crack, crack the tool. 
with ductile iron that won't happen. So when I started working with this foundry, I was using regular gray cast iron in the beginning, but I was worried about that, and they suggested I try the ductile. And when I did, I um, took a sledgehammer to the castings, and I dropped them from 15 feet up onto a you know, cement floor, and nothing happened. So I was sold, and I uh, never looked back on that. So this is um, our version of the Stanley. And if you can see the difference in weight. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. thickness of the blade. Now that yeah. blade is very stiff. I think those are the things that caught my eye first mm -hmm. and uh, caused me to buy my first Lee Nielsen plane. Yes. And all of it works together to keep down chatter. Yeah, absolutely. And Keep yeah. down chatter and to be a planing pleasure. So this is still my favorite tool, and it's one of our most popular tools. Through the years, the Lee Nielsen product line has expanded into a full line of planes, back saws, chisels, and almost everything that a fine woodworker would want at their bench. Tom, uh, these are great tools, and they affect all of us that are passionate about woodworking. And how would you like to be remembered as a toolmaker, woodworker, or, or your, your influence? Well, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. <laughs> well, you've been too busy making all these tools. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who uh, did their very best to make the very best tools they possibly could. And, uh, and somebody who didn't just uh, stop when they reached a certain level, because I've done a lot of things over the years to improve on what I thought was very good at the time, and we're still improving what we're doing. Better finishes, better machining, you know, better heat treating, better grinding, all of that to make it a much better experience for our customers. All right, I've got the Festool 1400 EQ Plus router here in the shop. I've always wanted one. Uh, I've got a bunch of other routers that I've accumulated, but this one is really the Cadillac of the everyday router. Uh, it's got so many features built in, but the feature that matters the most is how well does it produce the edge that, that you need. So I've got a rabbiting bit, an edge forming bit, here in the router, and I'm just going to uh, plunge in and see how well it performs. Now, that is some fine edge forming there. A great rabbit, had plenty of power. I know I'm going to be happy with this router for a long time. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of The Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Follow us on our social media channels as well. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.